Um, thank you uh, for that introduction and uh, that earlier plug from Jerry. I hope I do not disappoint. Um, I'm quite proud to be standing here in Alberta, being in the food business, a bit of an oxymoron. Uh, but there's also a few other great companies that I am in company with that are here today. Honey Bunny, Kitchen Partners, Sunrise Bakery, thank you. Um, I've been asked today to briefly talk to you about the little potato company, how we started, um, our challenges, and I'm going to share with you some of my key learnings. So, Little Potato Company, we do what our name is, and we grow creamer potatoes and only creamer potatoes. And we're the only company in the world, and actually a brag, the biggest one in the world that only does creamer potatoes. So very simply, very focused, just little potatoes. So a bit of a background on us, uh, what is a creamer potato? Well, creamers are the smallest potato in the family. Uh, they're about the size of a golf ball, and bar none, the best potato around. That's my, my plug, my one and only plug. So a bit about us. Um, we grow about 5,000 acres commercially and an additional 2,000 acres of seed potatoes. We harvest over 80 million pounds of creamers every year. We employ about 145 people, and our products are found in major retailers across Canada and in the USA. Um, majority of our business is retail. We do a bit of food service. And we have two packing facilities, uh, one here in Edmonton and um, also one in PEI. So we started about 20 years ago, my father and I. Uh, my dad, who is a Dutch immigrant, um, always talked about the small potatoes he enjoyed as a young boy and uh, convinced me to help him start the business. And I reluctantly agreed. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with my political science degree anyway. So um, I, I promised I would help him, and then I would go on to bigger and better things. But um, I completely fell in love with food and potatoes. So here I am 20 years later. We, uh, our first acre was a one-acre plot just outside of Edmonton. We planted it by hand, harvested it by hand, washed it in a bathtub, that is a true story, um, and shopped them around to farmer's markets. So what made it so successful in the beginning? Um, well, people loved the product right from the get-go. Uh, it was the right product at the right time. Uh, we married convenience and health together. And convenience being a huge trend right now, our potatoes thin skin, you eat them with the skin on, the nutrition's in the skin, they cook in 15 minutes or five minutes in a microwave, and they're great tasting. So before we knew it, the demand outstripped our supply and that continues to be our story. So in the beginning, many challenges like many businesses that start off. Um, first of all, we had regulatory um, issues, in particular, uh, we were not allowed to pack in a bag any smaller than a five pound bag. We needed a plant. Obviously, we uh, outgrew our bathtub. Um, we very quickly uh, had to outgrow and grow more than our one acre test plot, so we needed to find more acres and more growers. And of course, as we grew, we were in a province that was predominantly focused on energy, and agriculture was not really a thought for a lot of people to work in. So, like many challenges or issues, that brings innovation. And so one of the things that we didn't accept was no as an answer. So we lobbied the government to get changes to our regulatory packaging, and we were approved a year later to be able to pack our small potatoes in two and one pound bags. We also face an industry where the traditional equipment would not work for our small potatoes. So we had to start looking outside of our industry, looked at candy, carrots, anything other than potato equipment to be able to facilitate um, washing and packing small potatoes. We also obviously had no growers that grew potatoes, or small potatoes in particular. Uh, so we started by doing it ourselves and then slowly brought on growers. And we continue to have adaptive and very creative HR practices. 
So one of the things that we also did in, in the innovation part was the whole marketing. Uh, we insisted on marketing potatoes differently. Uh, at this time, potatoes are mostly bulk and big. We brought in small, colorful bags, promoted varieties and personalities. We branded each potato. We ran big promotions and contests that got consumers excited. We figured that if we wanted to change people's perceptions of potatoes, we needed to change how they were presented. So some of the lessons from the earlier years, uh, when you first start, you're obviously just busy about the business and getting things done. But as more employees came on, it became very apparent that we needed to have a very clear vision, uh, which included values and a purpose for the company. So that has become, I think, instrumental in for us in being able to recruit and retain great people, is having a very clearly defined culture, which includes your core values and your purpose. Um, Partnerships are like marriages. Uh, learned this, obviously, many hard times over, Jerry can attest. Uh, this is, I think, uh, like marriages, partnerships are work, and they take, um, they take time, they take nurturing. And so at the very least, like who you're working with. Ignore the naysayers. There will be many, including yourself, and I really encourage you to not listen. <laughs> um, Hire for your gaps. This has been one of my biggest lessons, uh, the whole thing about self-awareness, being able to embrace yourself for who you are, your strengths and your weaknesses, and being able to go, okay, this is something that either brings me energy or drains me of energy, and hire for the, for the things that aren't bringing value to you or to the company. Understand and know your critical points of your business. Be aware of what levers in your business are predominantly the most impactful. And never abdicate them. Delegate them, hire for them, but understand them and know them. And follow your intuition. Yes, that intangible thing that we feel in our gut, listen to it. It's almost always right. So we continue on the innovation. Uh, my father also started a breeding company uh, at the same time we started our our company and so we have three breeding programs in the world uh, so we continue to look for new and breed new potato varieties um, agronomics as well addressing on how to do more on an, an acre of land instead of doing more acres how can we get more out of one piece of land and we began to dive deeper and started to professionalize our innovation. So in the beginning, when you start a company, the idea is the innovation. And what I learned is that you need to professionalize it, add a process to it so that it becomes part of the spirit of the company. So part of our innovation was the rebranding we did about a year ago. Um, a lot of consumer research went into how we were going to package this and present this and um, ended up with uh, a great, I think, a great look. And as well as we, that ability was we could get into markets that we hadn't been in before. So in addition, uh, moving towards more convenience and more fresh as well, um, we sought to improve the convenience of our product. Value added becoming increasingly important in consumers. Um, so we have a microwave and an oven roasting kit. Um, and again, these are fresh potatoes, no, no processing done at this point. The other thing uh, in the way which we have also continued to innovate in our marketing, um, we look for always new ways to get the message out. Uh, we use non-typical ways of marketing, which has been pegged quite often as a very boring commodity category. So we like to create excitement and fun around our product. Some of the biggest lessons from the most recent years, um, the importance of saying no. So I've learned it's as important to say no to opportunities as it is to say yes. And being laser focused and being great at one thing rather than good at many. Outcompete yourself. So it's critical to not only continuously improve, but to make your best-selling product obsolete. Because if you're not working on doing that, your competitors are. 
Know your numbers, understand your financials, they don't lie. Hire slow, fire quick. Hire for culture first and skill second. And when there isn't a fit, let it go. Ask for help. There are so many people in the industry that are waiting for people to ask them for advice. And I've learned this firsthand with business coaches and a board of advisors, Jerry being on one of them. I can't say enough about it. Um, surround yourself with people that can see your blind spots, that can push you and challenge you and that have been there and done it. Culture doesn't just happen. As you grow a business, your culture can deteriorate and maintaining a healthy culture is intentional and it's work. Know your trade-offs. And this is one thing that I'm uh, learning and dealing with now is understand that as you grow that there are trade-offs, whether it's control, culture, operational efficiencies, market. Um, know what they are and know what you're willing to give up for one. And I want to leave you with one of my favorite pictures. These are all potatoes, if you can believe it. Um, I want to leave you with the importance of dreaming big and why it's important, if you've ever heard of, to have a big, hairy, audacious goal. To not be afraid to visualize what could be. There will always be challenges, and when they seem insurmountable, that's when you need to really grasp onto your vision and what you think you're going to be. Articulate your vision and defend it. We continue to dream big at the Little Potato Company. In fact, our mission is to save the, pota save the potato, feed the world. By the year 2050, there will be about 9, million, 9 billion mouths on this planet to feed. And it's our responsibility and our opportunity to feed these many people sustainably. And I challenge you all to keep that in mind as you plan your own very big, hairy, audacious goal. And I wish you every success in doing so.